Um, you know, going back to the first class, I laid out my big three, right? Who produces our food, how it's produced, and who has access to what types of food. And we've discussed since then is that industrial farms, for the most part, right, 80% of, of what we consume nationally comes from uh, industrial farms, for the most part, using conventional practices. And we've talked that it makes our environment sick, it makes our farm economy sick, and tonight we're going to look at how it makes and has created a sick population. So to be redundant, get big or get out as a food policy is counterproductive to wellness and health. Last class we looked at how industry influences research and policy and bombards us with messaging to consume their products. We discussed that organic research is underfunded and disincentivized by those same businesses whose interests run counter to regenerative practices. And just to be redundant, right? We've looked at the environmental and economic impacts of overproduction of cheap food. And tonight we will look at how overproduction has impacted our population. And as we go through this, well, think about all the workers along the food chain, right? Who lack health care coverage for the most part, paid sick days, adequate training on equipment. In fact, injury rates are 45% for higher for, for food chain workers than for any other um, employment sector in the US. And this morning, in um, uh, Morning Politico, there was an article that kids, and when we look at injuries for children, 45% of injuries of kids happen, I'm oh, sorry, 55% of injuries happen um, in, in, a, in the agricultural sector, not just the food sector. And that the small farms are exempt from OSHA oversight. So laying out tonight's class, right, I'm gonna address the physical impacts on, on looking at growing practices, diets and subsidies, and then our guests will look at disparate access to health foods, what the city is doing to address that, and hunger. So we've seen this video in week, uh, this picture, sorry, in week two about environmental impacts, right? This is algal bloom. But it's not just environmental risk that we're talking about here. We're looking at water contamination and depletion, and this has substantial risk to human health. Right? Moreover, we've seen some areas in this country have experienced over 30% depletion of their groundwater. That is a direct risk to human health. Climate change, right? The fires that are, what's been happening in California, drought globally, and also what happened for, for years in California. Extreme weather patterns, we're seeing hurricanes, categories that are becoming the norm that, we're, that we've never, that we're supposed to happen every hundred years. 500 mile sto wide storms followed by 600 mile storms. We saw what happened in Puerto Rico. We've seen what's happening along our, our own coasts. And this is not disconnected from fossil fuel depletion, um, from warfare to the health risks associated with emissions. These, all, all of these growing practices and these environmental impacts, again, directly impact human health. Now, I didn't know until preparing for tonight that industrial agriculture is the largest contributor to air pollution in the world and is highly deadly. Ammonia from nitrogen and manure, hydrogen sulfide and other airborne particulates that lead to respiratory illnesses and other health impacts threaten the lives of ag workers, farm families, and their neighbors. Right? Glyphosate. I keep, I've been saying glyphosate for the last three years, and today I was finally called out when I was practicing for tonight. Glyphosate, a Monsanto herbicide, right? Prior to 2015, the EU and the U.S. categorized this as a non-carcinogen. In 2015, the World Health Organization classified it as a probable carcinogenic, and in 2017, California listed it as a chemical known to cause cancer. 
They created a no-risk level that was 60 times lower than the EPA's no-risk level. Over 250 million pounds of glyphosate is sprayed annually on U.S. crops, primarily on corn and soy. It's also sprayed just before harvest on wheat, barley, oats, and beans. And what it does is it kills the crops. So it, um, it dries up those crops and expedites the, the time so that the farmers can harvest it. So it's totally unnecessary, but it, it quickens the process from seed to harvest. In a 2017 Canadian Food Inspection Agency study, they found residue in nearly glyphosate residue in nearly 30% of fresh and processed fruits, vegetables, grains, and infant formula. More recently, on October 24th, a study by the Environmental Working Group tested 28 products containing oats, cereals, granola, oat bars. Glyphosate was present in every sample, including or the organic products through drift and, um, just it, and through rain. Um, every product that was tested is a product that's marketed to children. In fact, Cheerios and Quaker Oats had the highest levels of contamination. And in 26 out of 28 of the products, the health levels exceeded what the Environmental Working Group health benchmarks by 18 times. This past August, a California jury awarded $289 million in damages to a, that was actually for, then reduced to, I think, to about $80 million in damages to a 46-year-old groundkeeper, groundskeeper that developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma by repeatedly spraying glyphosate products. Meanwhile, I've written glyphosate on my paper, so I'm like paying extra attention to say it correctly. And what the jury found was that going back to the 80s, not only did Monsanto know that there were health risks associated with this, with this product. And not only did they fail to disclose these health risks, but they spent decades influencing industry research and the EPA research so that to promote a safe product. Michael? Yeah. So you said that there was found in organic products yeah. as well. And I wonder, uh, do you have a reason why you think that? You know, it's, it's, through, it's through drift. And it, it's actually, it been, I think, what's So, oh yeah, it said it was found in organic products. Why do, what do we attribute that to? Um, and I'm saying drift, but also through atmosphere and through rain. Um, we know farmers uh, who actually export, and 70% of what they exported to the European Union was rejected this, this past year because of glyphosate. And none of their neighbors are using this product. Um, there's going to be another fun word for me. Who knows what this is? Anyone? <coughs> Terminator X? Terminator X. Um, this is chlorpyrifos. Chlor All right? Chlorpyrifos. This is a pesticide that in 2016, the Obama administration, the EPA, determined caused neurodevelopmental damage to children and fetuses, and subsequently halted all use until it could implement an official ban. Well, in 2017, Scott Pruitt, acting as the EPA administrator, lifted that ban and allowed its use. Right? Probably no surprise, this is a Dow Chemical product, Right? Dow Chemical contributed a million dollars to the inaugural fund for the Trump administration. Oh. And Scott Pruitt, as the Oklahoma Attorney General, which he served as prior to becoming the EPA Administrator, sued the Obama Administrator 14 times on regulations like these. Well, um, after he lifted the ban, a coalition of farm labor justice organizations re re uh, represented by Earth Justice and shared by and joined by New York State, Washington State, California, and Washington and the District of Columbia, sued the EPA, and last month the Ninth Circuit reimposed <coughs> the ban. But we see how policy is made, unmade, and remade. 
You have courts, you have administrators, and, and one administration is going to see things very differently than the next administration. So 80% of all antibiotics are used on factory farm animals. 70% of all antibiotics are used on healthy animals. Only 10% of that is used on sick animals. It's prophylactic usage. And so this leads to antimicrobial resistance, from which 23,000 individuals die in the United States annually. Uh, antibiotic resistant bacterial strains that spread through human populations, through worker exposure, flies, animal transport vehicles, animal products, and other mechanisms. The misuse on animal poses an incredible risk to human populations as the effectiveness of what basically saves our lives from diseases gets re greatly reduced. The EU has implemented a gradual ban on um, antibiotic use on farms, while the US essentially created another voluntary program. One more, what's this? There you go. Recombinant bovine growth hormone, right? Which is one of many steroids that are used in food production. It's banned in the EU, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and Israel. And in many circumstances, it's been banned for nearly two decades, knowing the risks of its use. So and the health risk is not from elevated levels of the bovine growth hormone itself, but rather of IGF-1 which is a hormone that normally helps some types of cells grow. There are conflicting studies that show a causal relationship between tumor growth, heightened levels of prostate, breast, colorectal, and other cancers. We do know for certain that it makes the cows very sick themselves, and yet the American Cancer Society has no official position on its use. Right? So, <laughs> How we grow our food and who grows our food matters. And I haven't even talked about what we're producing is making us sick. How we're producing it is making us sick and making our planet sick. So we've looked at actual production. And we're now going to switch into what we produce and who has access to, to what we what would produce. Starting with our dietary guidelines. And I'm going to once, and this will be the last time, but I, I love having her in the room. I'm going to show one quick video. Uh, I'm going to pick up where Mary and Nestle left off Yay. last week. And yesterday. And yesterday. <laughs> Another change in the food system has to do uh, with the enormous increase in serving size in the United States. Those of you who visited the States recently are kind of astonished when you go into a restaurant and order what you think is a reasonable amount of food and, and on your plate is something that you would eat for three days. Um, and I'm not exaggerating. The size of portions has increased dramatically since 1980. And if I had one thing that I could teach, just one, it would be that larger portions have more calories. <laughs> I know it sounds hilariously funny, but it's not intuitively obvious. I can prove that it's not intuitively obvious. People think if it comes in a container, it has 100 calories, and that's it. But really, larger portions have more calories, and that's all the explanation that you need for why the levels of obesity have increased so greatly in the United States. So another change in policy that's occurred since 1980s is um, the change in relative prices of foods. And I show this because there's a lot of feeling that healthier foods cost more than the foods that are less healthy, and in fact, they do. These are Department of Commerce figures from 1980 to the present, and what they show is that fresh fruits and vegetables and processed fruits and <coughs> vegetables have increased in price at a much, much greater rate than the food system as a whole, which is that bar in the middle, and then the ones that are at the bottom are fats and oils, sugars and sweets, and carbonated beverages have increased in price at a much, much slower rate. So there's a great financial incentive 
to consume foods that are highly processed. And that's part of the food system. So we've created a food system in which the food industry and the government and the entire food environment um, are promoting a diet that encourages people to eat more, not less, and more of the wrong kinds of food. So that brings me to the whole question of policy. And we in the United States have two different kinds of policy. We have a nutrition policy that is aimed at helping people decide what to eat. It's on the consumption side. And we have agricultural policy that's aimed at talking about food production. And these are two completely separate policies handled in most aspects by separate agencies. And they have nothing whatsoever to do with each other. They need to be brought together. So let me show you how that works uh, and ask the question, where in the United States nutrition policy uh, is agriculture? Nutrition policy in the United States is expressed in the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, which started in 1980 and have come out every five years. Since then, the most recent ones came out last year. And nowhere in any of these documents is anything about agricultural production. Now, that's not for lack of trying. For the 2015 Dietary Guidelines, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee was familiar with the evidence about contribution of foods to climate change. And they proposed in their report to the agencies that produce the dietary guidelines that a diet higher in plant-based foods and lower in animal products would be best for health and would be best for the environment. And they used the word sustainability. They said it would be better for sustainability which has become, in the United States, the S word. The meat industry was so upset about this that they immediately went to Congress and complained. Congress passed an act, if you can believe anything like this, that told the Department of Agriculture that they could not say anything in the dietary guidelines about sustainability. The Secretary of Agriculture announced six months before the dietary guidelines were released that the dietary guidelines would not use the word sustainability. And nowhere in the 144 pages of the dietary guidelines from 2015 does the word sustainability exist. So that's agriculture and nutrition policy forbidden. What about nutrition and agricultural policy? Well, it turns out the Department of Agriculture in the United States is a very complicated <laughs> agency, and it has offices that work at cross-purposes from each other. One office says, make half your plate fruits and vegetables. Not bad. That would be good for health, and it would be good for the environment. But the real money in the Department of Agriculture, which is the money that goes into agricultural subsidies, does something quite different subsidizes corn and other grains that are the food for animals. So it's supporting animal agriculture. The percentage of subsidies, this was 2008 to 2012. We don't have these kinds of figures more recently, but nothing has changed very much. 0.45% of the subsidies in the Department of Agriculture went to fruits and vegetables, and that was less than the amount that went to tobacco, we're still subsidizing tobacco to a very small extent. Um, so very contradictory policies that don't take nutrition and health into consideration, they should. Tobacco is subsidized more than fruits and vegetables. It's stunning. So, Marion's numbers are a little bit different than mine, um, I found that in 1990, <coughs> the National Nutrition Monitoring and Related Research Act required that every five years the departments, the U.S. Departments of Health and Human Services and the U USDA <coughs> must jointly publish a report containing nutritional and dietary information and guidelines for the general public. The law requires that the dietary guidelines be based on the preponderance of current scientific and medical knowledge, right? Which is fantastic, as Marion said, right? And the recommendations, these are, these are actually the 2015 to uh, 2020 recommendations. 
follow a healthy eater, eating pattern across the lifespan. All food and beverage choices matter. Choose a healthy eating pattern at an appropriate calorie level to help achieve and maintain a healthy body weight. Focus on variety, nutrient density, and amount. Limit calories from added sugars and saturated fats and reduce sodium intake. Shift to healthier food and beverage choices. <coughs> support uh, healthy eating patterns for all. Right? And yet, our, we are subsidizing quite the opposite. We produce twice as much meat, eggs, and nuts, 50% more grains and vegetables, and 60% more fats and oils than we consume. That's what Get Big or Get Out has provided. And despite the dietary guidelines, right, that are based on the preponderance of current scientific and medical knowledge of what is best for our human population, our same USDA subsidizes a system that favors commodities over fruits and vegetables and leads to cheap oils, grains, and processed foods and processed meats that rely on these cheap inputs. Now, this past Sunday, I apologized who I did not invite. I had a party at my house, and someone brought Mott's applesauce. I love applesauce. Why does Mott's applesauce need to have high fructose corn syrup in it? So I looked at it, there's 25 grams of sugar per serving in Mott's applesauce. And of course, the sugar industry we talked about, there's no, on the label, there's, it doesn't tell you what the daily recommended amount is because our sugar industry doesn't want us to know that. Because if we saw 25 grams, parents would be out of, you know, and, and we're knowledgeable about it, they would be living. And what are the results of this, of the subsidies and our food policy actually being about cheap food and cheap fats and cheap oils? Two-thirds of adults and a quarter of children are classified as overweight or obese. And a little uh, point of, of reference to say that there is no shaming going on from this, this stand. I'm one of those adults. I float between overweight and obese, depending on the week. And uh, I have access to some of the best foods produced in, in the United States, some of the best information and the means to buy good, healthy food. Um, this represents a 65% increase in the rates of obesity over the past 30 years. So if you look at this map, the orange is 25 to 29.9% obesity rate, red is 30 to 34.9%, and purple is over 35%. Right? The rates for adults is at or above 35% in seven states, at least 30% in 29 states. West Virginia has the highest rate at 38.1%, and Colorado has the lowest at 22.6%. This morning, my Civil Eats pop-up, I got a, uh, an article that Denver's new sales tax is the first in the nation to benefit kids' health. So the past election, uh, over 50, where am I here? 59% of voter <laughs> approval in Denver passed an ordinance that um, implemented less than a penny on any $10 purchase. So it's a, it's, a, it's a nominal sales tax, and that the funds that are generated through that are to fund healthy food access and educational programs for youth in Denver over a 10-year period. And the estimates are this will raise $11.2 million a year, or over $100 million over, the ten, the, those, over those 10 years, in a nominal less than one cent tax to fund programs related to health for children. That's policy, right? And before we look at the health impacts of being obese and overweight, I want to point out another, you know, we looked at voluntary industry um, guidelines for marketing last week. This is the equivalent in the restaurant industry. Kids live well. So 150 restaurant chains representing 42,000 individual locations uh, committed to a voluntary and self-regulatory program of offering at least one children's meal and one individual item under 600 calories contain less fat and half the daily allowance of sodium and included healthy foods in it in the package like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, or lean protein. 
and in many cases the sodas were replaced with sugary drinks. And the result was that the average kid's meal in a restaurant in 2015 still contained twice the calories recommended for small children and more than 60% of their recommended daily amount of sodium. That's voluntary self-regulation for you. Can anyone, does anyone know what the daily recommended amount of sodium is for an adult? 2,300, 20, 20, well, the USDA says 2,300, right? 1500. The American Heart Association is 1,500. The American Diabetes Association and the Academy of Nutrition and, and Dietetics says somewhere between that 1,500 to 2,300 milligram range. How many tablespoons of salt is 1,500 milligrams? One, two, five. One, two. Okay. It's 0.75 teaspoons. That's 1,500 milligrams, right? 2,300 is one teaspoon of salt. That's the daily recommended allowance. So in our general population, we know that red meat and processed meat and sugars and high caloric foods are associated with cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome and various cancers, right? Or is, or is not here today, huh? But a few, a few, I think in week two, we looked at the map that she created when we did our community food map and had discussions around what's available in neighborhoods that have been marginalized through intentional policies that are disproportionately impacted by food availability. And here's one of the things we've learned about food access and poverty. Uh, in 2016, 40.6 million Americans lived in poverty, which represented about 12.7% of the U.S. population. 13.2 million of, that, of those Americans were children, which represents 18% of all children. And again, referring back to Aura's map, anecdotally, but what we know through research, is that there are few, fewer full-service grocery stores, parks and recreational facilities, and higher concentrations of fast food and fast food advertising. Poverty leads to greater food insecurity, which results in increased rates of hypertension, coronary heart disease, hepatitis, stroke, cancer, asthma, diabetes, arthritis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and kidney disease. <clears throat> What's interesting and in what we read for today, and from a policy intervention, is that food insecurity is actually a greater predictor of chronic illness than is poverty. So from an intervention, as we address poverty, we need to be addressing access. Right? The irony of food insecurity, and related to health, <coughs> is that food insecure pay more for health costs than the food secure that have the exact same disease. Right? In general, they spend $1,863 more in health-related <coughs> expenditures and their food-secure counterparts with the same chronic illness. The highest rates, $5,144 more annually for heart disease, and $4,144 for expenses related to diabetes. Per individual. For individual. Per individual. Food insecurity results in increased physician visits, emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and expenditures for medications. 2014, the health-related costs of hunger were $160 billion. So before I turn it over to our first guest, I want to leave us with this. I, I love the article that we read that came out of Hopkins, Johns Hopkins. And the quote that they used is that a sustainable food system is one that provides available, accessible, acceptable, and adequate food without impinging on the rights of future generations to have the same. With availability, they define it as sufficient food to consistently meet the energy and nutrient requirements of the population. Accessibility was defined as the ability of each person or group of people to obtain food and the equitable distribution of food at a societal or global level. 
quote, in simple terms, access means having sufficient resources and ability to obtain appropriate foods for a nutritious diet without sacrificing other basic necessities. Accessibility was uh, broken into physical, economic, informational, and non-discriminatory access. And acceptability was the ability to obtain food that satisfies the social and cultural values of a particular population. In order to, to accomplish this, we need an ecological agricultural system that is self-renewing through soil, water, and plant varieties, that incorporates growing practices of rotation and cover cropping, and IPM, low-till, no-till, and manages waste. This is what we talked about in week two, right? And it requires diets that are less dependent on foods that require high inputs. I love the way they summed up this issue and addressed the big S, as Marion said. So I'm, I'm now going to ask Javier Lopez to, to come on up and, and join us. Sure. When I asked him how, how should I introduce him, uh, he said, just say I'm, I'm a cool person that happens to be an assistant commissioner at the New York City Department of Health, uh, Center, Health Centers, for, the Centers for Health Equity. But I will tell you that Javier and I have been working together for about 11 and a half years now, and he is someone who allowed me to make a mistake in trying to figure out how we distribute more good food equitably and how we learn not to put all your eggs in one for-profit basket, right? And not to try to squeeze a, a square peg into a round hole. And uh, because of him, partly, Green Market Co. is now distributing food throughout the five boroughs. So Javier, come on up. Thank you for joining us. So good evening, everybody. Um, it's really cool to be here this evening. Uh, you know, when I was pegged to come and talk about the work uh, that we're talking about this evening, I was wanted to, to make it as real as possible because I feel for some of you in the audience, the, the program that I'm going to describe, you know. I know specifically there are many, many in the audience that know the program. And it's really going to give some insight into how hard it is to move a successful program that is seen and lauded by many in a direction that's really addressing the inequities that still remain. And uh, this uh, presentation is called, you know, uh, A Journey about the Shop Healthy program. And it's a program that has been established in New York City for quite some time. It's had a, it's had a couple of different names, so it's had one different name at one point. And finally, I can say the first time in, in my tenure at the health department that just made its fourth year is going in the direction that I feel is going to answer some of the questions that many in the room may have been asking and I know I've been asking for, for at least four years. So I represent this initiative that comes out of the Center for Health Equity, which is the New York City Health Department's <coughs> division that really is asking um, as one full division, you know, how, what creates health in one neighborhood. Now, I should say that many Divisions in the health department have asked this question for years. Um, health equity is not a new concept. A lot of people joined the health department from 10 to 20 years ago that were trying to answer the same questions we were coming at it today. I think what makes us unique is that the entire division is asking this question, not just one. So this is a, a framework that uh, friends of mine for the Bay Area, uh, the Bay Area Regional Health Initiative team had put together many years ago, but it's something I reference as just a, as a talking point, uh, a lot of times when folks are thinking about what creates health or what the response to health inequities or health disparities should be, you know, the right side of the spectrum is usually the response. So if you're looking from my left to the right, you usually see programmatic interventions that really address risk behaviors, diseases, and mortality, and that's a good thing because if you've worked in neighborhoods that have been disinvested in, you go to any community meeting, first people thing people say is like, we need more programs, we need more services. So addressing that on the right hand of the spectrum is something that I applaud because as someone who's worked in neighborhoods, as Michael was highlighting, that's, that's the initial first step. What usually doesn't occur is going from the right to the left, whereas an institution, you're, you're thinking about living conditions, institutional inequities, and social inequities that is actually making the reason for that response possible. That's the hard part when you start deconstructing why something looks the way it looks. 
Um, it's easy kind of to go to a service program response because that's what you can do. What's harder is holding yourself as an institution accountable for what you've contributed to, to the living conditions, what you've contributed to in terms of institutional inequity and social inequity and extending that conversation to other players that could make your work actually more successful. So that's a question that I routinely ask within our unit is, you know, what creates help? What do you think it is? And when I'm actually working with other city agencies and different people who don't see themselves in health, I usually pull this up and I'm like, you are basically the landlord. You are the person building the property. You're the person designing the institutions in your community. So you contribute to health every single day and you don't even realize it. So you're a public health practitioner. Uh, the work of our agency, or as to say our division, you know, falls into these categories, and I, and I have to do this. So it's not something that I do generally, if you see me after hours, but I'm coming in my formal capacity. So we have a vision and a mission that is up top, and you know, what makes us unique as an entity within the health department is that we take these approaches, um, transform, name, focus, mobilize, and change. Uh, you know, what we really have become strong at over the last four years is I think we've worked really hard within our institution to become a racial justice and multicultural organization. Um, Dr. Mary Bassett, who was our former health commissioner, really pushed us to work across the agency to become that. I don't think we are that, but I think we've come along and made some great strides the last four years with the way in which we hire, how we do research, and the way in which we frame our work. As a part of the work I lead, um, and this is something that I instituted this year, I was very concerned that we were just freestyling work, and we were just doing the work that was applauded and not doing the work that was needed. So um, I took apart the approaches of our division, and I asked our co my colleagues who were leading this work, you know, really research the root causes, um, push yourself to change the narrative around what creates health, and build the capacity of partners to lead narrative change on what creates health. So what I mean by that is, you know, researching root causes is what I said on that chart, what I said to the left. Know what those things are when you're leading your work. Understand that the narrative around your work has already been set by other people than yourselves and the people you're serving. I tend to look at it from a public safety and violence scenario because a part of my portfolio <coughs> includes anti-violence work. So the people that lead the, the violence narrative are usually NYPD, politicians and media, and rarely do you see the people that are impacted by violence talking about what would make the violence go away. Usually the respondents are like, we need more police, we need this, we need that, and it doesn't talk about the root causes of violence in the first place. So it pertains, as it pertains to food and food access, I think Michael did a great job of really saying what is the, the root causes on, around why obesity and diet-related diseases are playing out, and rarely do you, fear, you see a response to some of that. So I challenge my colleagues uh, to focus this way because I think it's an approach that would allow what I consider um, the outcomes to be, you know, more neighborhood leaders talking about the work differently just so they come to a session and say we need services and we need that building to be better, right? Usually it's service, service, service. I'm saying if you change the narrative and you lift up the root causes that the conversations in the neighborhoods you serve will change and evolve and become multifaceted. So Shop Healthy New York City, uh, and I see in the back Kathy, what's up Kathy? Hey. <laughs> Kathy Nones and a lot of folks, Allison was going to be talking and many others who really were the architects of how the health department responds to the crisis that is, you know, fruit and vegetable access, diet related diseases and obesity rates, established a program called Healthy Bodegas. And through that program there was an evolution, I'm not going to get into the history of that, but we have now uh, Shop Healthy New York City, which was founded in 2012, and it grew out of years of intensive work with a lot of retailers and neighborhoods that have been, that were classified as food deserts, not having the opportunities for folks to have access to fruit and vegetables, water, um, low sodium products, you name it. These folks that I highlighted were saying, we got to do a better job, and they moved the health department in the city of New York to make an investment. The concept is, you know, focusing on availability, affordability, and marketing, um, and I'll get into that in a couple of slides coming up. So I should say, before 2012, uh, Corner Store Food Retail Initiative Healthy Bodegas existed, but as time went on and as the program continued to grow out, you know, some of the highlights over those years, you know, we started uh, receiving uh, sales data for corner stores. There was a price parity project for low sodium cans. 
and a marketing initiative or county marketing initiative for the modern bodega display and store owner trainings at a big food distributor, Jetro, became normalized and became a part of the work. So the four components of the low is work that is ongoing and continues, in-store promotion. So if you work, in, work into a healthy bodega store, you'll see clear advertisements that say shop healthy store. You'll see advertisements, you'll see specials, you see everything from indications of where the low-sodium goods are at, pricing and discounts. There'll be specials for a, a turkey sandwich with water. Um, the identify of healthier products kind of goes hand in hand with the marketing. <coughs> and of course, there's overall marketing strategies that continue to evolve and remain. And these are the locations that have, the program has really uh, expanded out to. We call them waves. So in 2012, uh, the real concentration focused on the Bronx. Uh, going to 2017, the program has grown out to many pockets of the South Bronx, the North and Central Brooklyn, and parts of uh, East Harlem. Now, this coincides with the health department's investment in having the neighborhood, um, I used to call them district public health offices, now they're called uh, neighborhood health action centers. These are really um, the annexes of the health department that are concentrated in neighborhoods that historically have shown high inequity rates. I should say there's inequity rates across the entire New York City. The health department just doesn't happen to have uh, locations, building locations in some of those neighborhoods. So Far Rockaway, the North Shore se section of Staten Island, all the folks deserve that type of concentration and investment. Just giving you a flavor of the work, um, you know, we work across the, the pendulum. You know, we have uh, relationships with Crasdale and Goya. We have uh, relationships with folks doing urban farm initiatives. Um, we work with the store owner for store training and infrastructure transformation. It's a dope project to talk about, but I have problems with it. Um, this gives you a sense of involving local community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, is saying, hey, Mike, you represent uh, Green Markets. You're on the corner of 116th Street and 3rd Avenue. We have our healthy uh, shop healthy store across the street. Adopt that shop. Be a good job. We need people to maintain that relationship. We can't be there every day, but you can, so adopt it. And a lot of organizations have taken root and done that really well. I want to highlight Urban Health Plan, which is a federally qualified community health center <coughs> in the South Bronx, and the Southern Boulevard, Hutts Point section of the South Bronx is pretty much uh, the best uh, adopt-a-shop group because they have staff and everything that have followed up since the health department has led the intervention at the local stores. So I come back to this. You heard about the program. The program has touched thousands of locations, has impacted many store owners, and has created a community of other community-based organizations and institutions that have replicated the corner store food retail model um, in this city. So one can consider it a success. And for two and a half years, I've been trying my best to move our former commissioner and my boss to say, like, that's not enough. And folks were like, well, politically, it's a good program because we get proclamations and store owners, you know, can put up the advertisements, you can count it. And I'm like, that's not enough. So I came back to this question um, over the summer and said, you know, can we do a little bit more to really, you know, have an impact in a neighborhood that isn't something that is felt for, you know, a long period of time, but you really don't feel it. You don't see it as much. I came back to this question. So uh, my colleagues from Shop Healthy took it upon themselves and said, okay, Javi, we're going to come back to you. We're going to get to a place where we can do this work parallel to maybe answering some other questions. So uh, we come, we've come to this place where we want to really increase the knowledge around affordability for long-term long residents. And we, we're trying to, we're hypothesizing there's a link between gentrification and food mirages. So what is a food mirage? A food mirage is when a community is gentrifying, you have all these boutique shops and a lot of places popping up. Um, in El Barrio right now, if you walk around, I can say if you've known this area, like I've known this area for like 10 to 15 years, you see some of these places coming up. It's not as ubiquitous that you would see in other neighborhoods like Williamsburg and other <coughs> places that are synonymous with gentrification, but there's, there's a certain theme if you're a New York City resident that you can say, oh, this neighborhood's changing. So we want to get to a place where we change our food programming, we have policy recommendations and standardized evaluation tools, and we're really working hard to, to have real reflections with neighborhoods that we have worked with, so those waves, we want to go back in there to, to have a really uh, strong community participatory process that details out what the impact of the food retail component of the program has been. 
And we've done some preliminary analysis that really talked about how sustainable or not sustainable the program is. Um, and that's why we went to the prior slide. But I want to highlight this. Uh, the criteria most difficult to maintain for the program after one year, after technical assistance has ended, is offering a healthier deli option, having a front door free of unhealthy advertising. Um, I highlight that because that says that the program needs a lot of hand-holding. It needs a lot of follow-up. So if you're thinking about it, we have a staff of three, that a staff of nine, three in each borough, and if I'm saying to them, like, hey, you do this the first year and you have to keep going back, staff morale and satisfaction isn't there. They don't, they don't feel that they're being successful. They're like, damn, i got to keep going back to these stores and keep working with them as a staff of black and brown staff that we have that are pretty much from the neighborhoods that they're serving. They're like, we got to do more. So I highlight that because this didn't just come from the sky. They went back and they realized that the work that they're doing, um, there's, some, there's some gaps and some problems there. Uh, and they also realize that they have to do more work uh, from, that benefits the model, which is saying you got to keep offering different types of healthier deli options. You got to keep figuring out a way to having a front door free of unhealthy advertising. You have to keep figuring out a way to placing water and low calorie beverages at eye level. That's because the folks that are coming in and stocking the shelves are like taking off their advertisers, their counter art marketing. They're saying, take that special down. They're saying, oh, why well, you got that healthier option? Put the 99 cent Coke thing up there. So their work is constantly being slapped down and saying, you know, it's not sustainable. So what are we doing? This is some real inside baseball stuff, but I wanted to share it because this is the way government sometimes has to work for progress. So we have a division that's in the health department called the Division of Epidemiology. It is the division that really sets trends in many ways for the entire work of the agency through their research. So they have agreed to work with us over the next two years in creating a food basket, uh, create a food basket measure uh, that can be shared not only internally and externally, and a food basket measure that we're looking to uh, put together is, is focusing on the corner stores. So we're going to try to figure out, you know, over the next couple of months what that measure could be. And we're also working with them to collect and analyze pricing data from the program's catchment areas and comparison neighborhoods using a food basket measure. And that's real, you know, inside nerd stuff that I love because it, this is the type of work that's necessary to move the system of the health department to say that food retail project is not doing so much. It can do more. So I just had a meeting uh, before I came here with City Harvest where I presented this, um, and they were interested in sharing some of their Nielsen data to this food basket exercise that would be it would create more of a robust um, opportunity to collect data, to analyze data, and to hopefully move the program away from what it's doing now solely to really focus on policies and um, other impact measures that go beyond the bean counting approach that we currently do at the farm. So this isn't my traditional style of talking about the work, but I wanted to respect the space and the conversation that's happening. And I also wanted to offer the fact that this is how government works. Like, it's not like just turnkey. I wish Marion Nestle like, was the commissioner where you can be like, hey, you know, we can, <laughs> politics is necessary. Man, let me tell you, this program that has taken such a long time to transform just couldn't transform because and I love Dr. Bassett, but when she left, there was an opening. It was like, oh, you know, maybe we can do things a little bit differently now. and Maybe the program doesn't have to be um, positioned in a way. Maybe I can take staff away from touching all those stores and we can start collecting data differently and talking to neighborhoods that this program has been in differently because there isn't such an emphasis on going to every single store in a borough. And that was kind of like uh, the, the challenge that we were facing for the last couple of years. So uh, I gave you a sense if this was a staff meeting I would say, all right, this is what we're doing. Um, any feedback, any questions, but I'll hold because I know there's another presentation coming uh, for discussion. Uh, and I appreciate the space this evening. Thank you, Mike. Like I guess I'm not nearly as cool 
but I, you can say that uh, I'm the Senior Director of Programs at the West Side Campaign Against Hunger. I won't, I'm going to leave out the rest. But Allison and I have been working together for a, a long time, first at the Department of Health, then at Children's Aid, now at West Side Campaign Against Hunger, and we are blessed to have you here tonight. So Allison Rosenthal, come on up. Thank you. Everybody. Um, I just want to say that I'm really grateful to be here because I know that Stephen Grimaldi was supposed to um, pr be presenting tonight and he's a great partner of the West Side Campaign Against Hunger um, and New York Common Pantry is just a wonderful organization. So I just feel really grateful that um, I get to present tonight. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit more of like a background about who I am. Um, I have worked for the past 14 years on a variety of different food access initiatives um, and programs that really work to address the health inequities um, in communities. And as was mentioned um, by Javier, I did spend um, seven years at the New York City Health Department with Kathy Nones back there. Um, and so I did work on the first iteration of Shop Healthy, which was the Healthy Bodegas Initiative. Um, but spent the majority of my time as a senior manager of um, farmers market programs where I started um, st Stellar Farmers Markets and oversaw the Health Bucks program. Um, so I am now at the West Side Campaign Against Hunger. Um, we, we are one of the largest emergency food providers in New York City. We are known as what's called a, a super pantry. Um, we reach more than 25,000 individuals every single year. Um, so what I'm going to talk about um, today is I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview of food insecurity and what that landscape looks like in New York City. Um, I'm also going to talk about the role of emergency food in alleviating hunger and food insecurity, and then what WISCA, West Side Campaign Against Hunger, is doing to really sort of push the envelope of what it means to be an emergency food provider. Um, so in terms of food insecurity, um, there are about 12% um, of all Americans are food insecure. This is an extremely high number for a country that we've learned is so abundant in food that produces way more food than people are consuming. Um, and so what that means, according to the USDA definition, is that 15 million about, I mean, about 15 million Americans do not have enough food to live an active and healthy life. Um, and what's important, I think, to note is that food insecurity is really just an uh, indicator for poverty, right? It's a symptom of poverty. So the solution for food insecurity is not just to give a handout of food, right? It, it helps, but it is not necessarily the solution um, to the problem. And so um, I'm, we're going to talk a little bit about what are some of the different influencing factors that um, affect, that make people more prone to being food insecure. Um, but just to sort of like add on to what Javier was talking about before, um, we really need to look at food insecurity through an, an equity um, lens because black and Latino communities are actually two times more likely to be food insecure than the rest of the population. Um, so this is a map. Um, so it, uh, in New York City, um, it displays the meal gap, which is really just another measure for food insecurity. It's the difference, the number of meals that would be required to make a household food, food secure. Um, and so when you look at 
Um, the areas that are red or darker orange, those are the areas with the greatest meal gap or the areas that have the highest levels of food insecurity. And so, to no surprise, these are, you know, the, the neighborhood, like the Bronx and Washington Heights and Harlem and North and Central Brooklyn and places where, like, the health department focuses much of their work. Um, it's also places where people of color predominantly live. Um, and it's also where we see the highest rates of health inequities and in many cases the, the um, least access to healthy foods, the lowest consumption of fruits and vegetables, um, and like I said, the highest rates of you know, some of these chronic diseases that are diet related. Um, and so in New York, actually, uh, when you look at the population as a whole, it's about four, over, just over 14% of the population um, are actually um, food insecure and about one in five kids or 20% of all kids in New York City. But when you look at where it's concentrating, concentrated, the levels are much, much higher when you look at the more granular neighborhood level. Okay, so in terms of like what the influencing factors are for food insecurity, um, you know, things like obviously lack of financial resources, right? So the, the lack of the ability, this is, an, this is important. This is the overarching um, factor that prevents people from eating a healthy diet. Um, in New York City, um, the cost of living is so significant, as we all know. Um, there was a report that was put out um, not too long ago that said that on average, 60, uh, New Yorkers are spending 60% of their income on their rent, right? And the, the US government determined that anywhere over 30% is considered to be a cost burden, but we're, we're paying double that, right? And, and I know that many of you feel me with, with that statistic. But if you are, you know, maybe you're unemployed or you are making minimum wage, there really does not leave much left when you think about the cost of a Metro card or if you have healthcare expenses, um, so, um, so I just, yeah, I wanted to highlight that. And then again, I, I, I already pointed out the differences with, you know, racial and ethnic differences in terms of rates of food insecurity, but I wanted to talk a little bit about our political climate and I'm guessing that you guys have discussed or maybe not like the new proposed rule around the public charge. Um, and so this rule that the Trump administration is proposing is, um, really, um, you know, presenting a lot of fear in the immigrant community, and rightfully so, um, because if you are applying for citizenship or applying for a green card, and you or, or if anyone in your family um, has ever um, been a participant in SNAP benefits or Medicaid or different housing subsidies, it could put you in jeopardy of ever getting citizenship here, and so. What is happening in the immigrant community is that people are not signing up for benefits to which their families are entitled to and making them more vulnerable. So um, there was also a study recently which looked at, they surveyed women uh, with young children and um, they have already seen a 10% decline among the immigrant, amongst immigrant moms or families with you know, young children in their enrollment in, in the SNAP program. And so, you know, this is important, especially as we begin to think about the role of emergency food, is where are all of these folks going to be turning to, is, you know, to emergency food providers to help, you know, them feed their families. Then you have groups that, like senior citizens or folks with disabilities who are really living on fixed incomes. And, you know, simply just, you know, if something's got to give, it's going to be, you know, oftentimes it's going to be food. Um, so, in, so that's important. And then again, we've spoken about the neighborhood characteristics, right? And like what people have access to. What, what's the quality of the food? What's the pricing of that food in my community? Um, all factors that influence food security. Okay, and so there are some really wonderful, you know, programs that exist that are federal at the federal level, the state level, the city, you know, the city is doing amazing things like with health bucks and with, you know, uh, healthy bodegas and all the work they do in the supermarkets and hospitals and, and you know, farmers markets, etc. Um, 
But there's really no silver, silver bullet in terms of solving this complex issue. Um, and I really, you know, and some of these programs that I have up here are some of the federal programs that really look to target food, um, food insecurity. But if you look at a program like SNAP, which is, it's a wonderful program. However, the allotment of food stamp dollars equates to about $1.40 um, per meal per person. I don't know about you, but I don't think I can even prepare a meal for that for that amount. Um, not living in New York City, the food prices are just way too high, um, and let alone try to eat a healthy diet. So, all of this to say is that this is where the emergency food programs come into play. And when I say emergency food, I mean food pantries and soup kitchens. Okay, so what I wanted to say, so in terms of emergency food, what I wanted to say, what emergency food is not, is that it is actually not an emergency, okay? So um, we have 1.4 million New Yorkers who rely on emergency food providers every single year. Um, that's a significant amount of people. We also have more than 1,000 emergency food providers in the city, um, 760 of which are food pantries. So this is an institutionalized part of our food system, and it is where low-income folks are getting a significant amount of their um, food from. And so it's important to consider when we're thinking about um, health and um, neighborhood health inequities and, and, and trying to promote you know, healthier lifestyles, right? If people are going to emergency food providers and they're getting all of this heavily subsidized, cheap, nutrient-poor food, um, what are we doing to you know, benefit, benefit our communities? We're really not making much of an impact, we're just making our, food, our, our communities sicker. Um, I know for, for at the West Side Campaign Against Hunger, um, we've been around for 40 years, right? So this is, again, like not a new, um, not an emergency type situation. Our, some of our customers have been there for 10, 20 years. Um, and they're shopping at multiple pantries because this is just a way, the way of life, right? This is the way New Yorkers are making their ends meet is by, you know, and we're happy to do so, relying on you know food pantries to really to really give a give it a go at life in in, in New York or anywhere. Um, but I did have this picture here because this is a picture of a pantry that I visited in um, Poughkeepsie, New York. And this is not this is common, right? So this is just like a church pantry. It's a cupboard, and what do they have? It's what you might imagine that you know people collect at like a food drive, for example. It's just all canned processed foods, um, most of which really aren't supporting our health. Um, so, so at WISCO, we're really, like I said before, trying to push the envelope in terms of what it means to be an emergency food provider. Um, we really um, want to be at the forefront of alleviating hunger and coming up with innovative solutions. Um, for how we can solve this problem. Um, so if, I, I posted up our, our mission statement. Um, so, you know, like I said, we were looking to alleviate hunger by ensuring New York City communities have access with dignity to a choice of healthy food and services. Um, yeah. Okay, so we take a comprehensive approach, approach to our work. Um, so as I mentioned before, well, you know, we are not only providing food, we're also providing the supportive services and helping to um, build the skills of our customers to get jobs. Um, so the, the two pictures on top are, are photos of the two, two markets that we run. And um, I say market because it really... That's what it is. We are running a, we're running small grocery stores um, where people can choose the foods um, for their families. And then again, we have, like I said, we have social services and a job development program, which I will um, elaborate on in a moment. So one of the like values that we have that really drives our work is choice and quality. Um, the West Side Campaign Against Hunger was the innovator of the supermarket customer choice model. 
Um, so traditionally, food pantries um, gave out bags of food, um, and it was kind of just like whatever is in there. Um, too bad, you know, this is what you're getting, and you can go home now. Um, so it really like ignored people's culture, people's dietary needs, their food preferences. Um, and Wisco said, this is not good enough, uh, and, and decided to set up shop as a grocery store. And so people, when they come to our food pantry or our market, um, they actually get a grocery cart and they're going around and there's different departments and they're making the best choices um, for their families. You know, wh whatever they like to eat is what they can leave with. Um, of course, you know, we have different points depending on people's household size. Um, so everything's balanced on USDA My Plate, and there's really no unhealthy choices in our pantry. Um, we, we really pride ourselves on, on quality. Um, so we really refuse to be a dumping ground for some of the, you know, nutrient poor, just processed foods. So we and thankfully, under the leadership of our executive director, Greg Silverman, we are returning, we're telling trucks to go back. We do not have a need to distribute any of these junk foods in our food pantry. Um, and in fact, uh, recently around Thanksgiving, um, you know, oftentimes different groups have food drives and that food gets rescued by our wonderful partner, City Harvest. Um, and you know they, they deliver this food to all the different you know food pantries and we get some of it But what we did this year is we sorted through all that food and we sent back the food We didn't want back with City Harvest um, because again like we We we're, we don't feel we're doing a good job unless we are actually making a positive impact on our communities and And so this is really what sets us sets us apart also what sets us apart is that on any given day that you walk into our pantry, you will find that we have a minimum of eight choices of vegetables, five choices of fresh fruits. We always have fresh dairy. We have whole grains. We have lean frozen protein options. And so, um, and this is a priority for us. And we, we go to great lengths to make sure that this is, this is a possibility. Um, we do significant amount of fundraising, um, and you know we are purchasing food from Green Market Co. Um, we partner with CSAs to get whatever extra food is not distributed, and that ends up all in our pantry. We, we, you know, during the the wonderful like summer and fall months, we have all this organic, regionally grown food. It, it's it's really quite amazing the the level of of food. This is not you know, seconds. This is not the stuff that somebody else might have thrown away. Um, this is stuff that you might pay, you know, five to eight dollars for at Whole Foods. Um, we also um, are doing a lot of work around food rescue. And this is where I want to shout out uh, my colleague, Erica Friend, right here. Um, a lot of, um, so this work around our around food rescue and our mobile work is really much to the credit of Erica. Um, she really is the champion of this work. Um, but through, through our mobile market, which I'll tell you more about, um, we have a truck. And so what we've been doing is we have been rescuing our own food. I'm sure you guys have talked about that, about 40%, 30 to 40% of our food supply ends up wasted. Um, so we're, we're doing what we can do to prevent that and to redistribute that to communities who need it. Um, how, how many of you are familiar with the Hunts Point produce market? Okay, all right, speaking to my community. Okay, so, so you know that this is the world's largest wholesale produce market. Um, it provides about 60% of the food to New York City. So this place is massive. Um, and we are fortunate that we now have a, a shared warehouse space right in Hunts Point in the Bronx, around the corner from where Green Market Co. will soon be housed. Um, and we decided that we are going to build relationships inside the Hunts Point Produce Market. So now in a community that is probably one of the most food insecure in New York City, we are now getting food from that Hunts Point Produce Market and redistributing it or bringing it to the only food pantry um, in Hunts Point and bringing 
pounds and pounds of fresh produce to that community. And we're taking it to communities all across the Bronx and Washington Heights and Harlem. Um, every single Monday, we were taking our truck to City Harvest um, through their Golden Hub program, which is a fantastic program. And it allows us to rescue upwards of 10,000 pounds of fresh produce. And now, new, like newly, we're also rescuing frozen meat. Um, and we bring that to our 86th Street Pantry every single Monday. Um, so we just have massive quantities of the healthiest foods for our customers. And, um, and, and, it, and last year, I think our food, it was 61% of our food budget was in kind. This year it's going to be even higher because we're just, through Erica's work and others, we are building more and more relationships with uh, food vendors um, where we can, you know, get, where we can take advantage of, you know, maybe some of that food that they just couldn't get rid of. Okay, so um, I, I want to, uh, I'm going to play a little short video about our mobile market. Um, this is our latest initiative. It launched last October, so we're just over a year. Um, and it's been hugely successful. And um, it's our efforts really to bring food to community. Um, what the West Side Campaign Against Hunger is located on 86th Street in West End, not a very low income community. Um, most of our customers are coming down the 123 train line. They're coming from the Bronx, they're coming from Washington Heights, they're coming from Harlem. And for us, uh, we know we can be doing a better job. And so we raised money with the help of our city council member, Helen Rosenthal, through the participatory budgeting process to get this fantastic vehicle. And we are now able to bring the healthiest foods um, to some of the most vulnerable populations, to senior citizens, to folks with chronic health conditions in the Bronx, you know? And so, well, I'll let the video speak for itself. Give me, give me a sec. Friday, four days a week, and each day we do a different site. South Bronx, South View, Uptown Manhattan. We serve up to 150 people a day. The response has been great. People love it, people love our service. It's very touching to me because it shows me that what I'm doing is not only something that I love, but it's something that is actually changing people's life. It's fast, very convenient, it helps out a lot. A lot of people can't go, people can't shop like they want to shop. That's extra help, it's extra hand in. And so again, it's fresh. This is a good idea that people is coming here. It's very healthy and I hope they never stop coming back in here because there's a lot of people in here that they, they eat the food. So, um, you know, as you can see through that work, um, it's the people who we are serving, they're just so appreciative of, 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 of the food. And, and because, you know, we really pride ourselves on being reliable to the community. I, I don't even know if we've ever 
canceled one of our um, mobile market distributions. Like it could be raining, it could be cold, it could be you know whatever. We we are there, and that and that and we take that very seriously because we just we know how um, how important the what we are doing is to the people that we are you know serving. So I. So I mentioned before, you know, one of the values of the West Side Campaign Against Hunger is that we are not just giving, you know, a hand out, but that we are trying to help give people a hand up, right? So all of our customers, um, both at the mobile market and at our 86th Street location, everybody is screened, right? Because we want to make sure that we can meet the chat, we can help, you know, people overcome the challenges that they are experiencing. Um, we, we, you know, the food is only part of, of the solution. And so we have a team of social service counselors and we work with many great partners in the community to connect our customers to many great benefits like SNAP benefits and health insurance and financial and legal counseling, um, tax preparation. Um, pretty much you name it, um, we really work with folks to to really help them overcome the challenges and you know really help to build the relationship where they feel comfortable coming into our social service team and and you know talking about the challenges that they're facing. Um, so oh, and I guess I should say, you know, just to give you a little bit of perspective, um, last year we screened well over five thousand households, and we provided over 2,000 um, benefits to, to our customers. One of the other great things that we do at the West Side Campaign Against Hunger is we have a program that's called Culinary Pathways. So we have a chef on staff um, who leads a 12-week job training program where uh, she trains them in all the basic culinary skills that you might get from, you know, one of the fancier culinary programs. And we provide them with resume writing and cover letter and interview skills. Uh, we, we, we place them in internships so that they can get real life hands-on experience. Um, and we help them to get jobs because um, we know that one of the limiting factors for folks is really you know, getting that job that will pay them a living wage, um, something that's stable. Um, and for many of our folks that are part of this program, uh, they've never maybe graduated from high school. Maybe they haven't ever completed anything. And, and, and what we find is that people feel a real sense of accomplishment through this program and really go up, more than 80% of them are going on to get further education or, and or jobs. Uh, we also do provide some nutrition education at um, at, West, at our 86th Street location. We uh, do pantry tours, Cooking Matters pantry tours. We're doing taste sampling, recipe distribution, and things like this. Um, also, every day we provide a wholesome lunch to our staff and to our volunteers as a way of giving back, um, you know, for all the services that they help to make this work successful. Um, vol volunteerism is a huge part of our work. Uh, last year we engaged over 800 different volunteers. Um, and on any given day, um, you might see two different corporate groups and maybe 20 what we call customer volunteers. And so we really work to empower our customers um, to be change makers and to really give back to their community. So really the foundation of our of our organization is really run by the volunteers um, themselves and so these are some of our longtime volunteers some of them have been there for 20 years um, and they're the ones who are helping our customers shop they're the ones who are doing the checkout they're the ones who are greeting our customers um, and so it really forms a real great you know sense of community uh, which is something we value we also engage our customers in advocacy. We engage our board in advocacy and our staff. 
Uh, we, we're, we're testifying at, down at City Hall. We're going to the FRAC conferences. We're going up to Albany. We're constantly speaking with our city council representatives. When Food Bank has some, you know, uh, advocacy initiative that they're working on, you know, we're, we're always supportive of the work that the community is doing to help make uh, our, the lives of our customers and our community better. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some what is on the horizon for WISCA. Um, so, so for certain, like our mobile work is the future of our organization. Um, but what something really exciting that we're working on is collective purchasing. Have you all heard of this term before? Okay, so um, we recently were awarded a grant from the Robin Hood Foundation, also from the New York State Health Foundation, and um, at least one or two others. Um, to bring together the largest emergency food providers. So this includes St. John's Bread and Life, this includes New York Common Pantry and Project Hospitality, to see how we can work, you know, aggregate our purchasing power and really negotiate with our vendors to get better pricing, right? So this, the goal of this is not simply to get cheaper crappy food. The goal of this is to get you know, more healthy food um, to our customers, right? So that we can combat all of these societal, you know, all these, the subsidies and all the marketing of all these food companies. Um, how can we make sure that the most vulnerable group in New York City um, can have access? And, and for many of these are our organizations, right? Like there's a bottom line. And, and so if we can get pro better product at a lower cost, out to communities who need it, then we're doing a good job. So this is an initiative that I'm really excited. Um, we're hoping some way that Green Market Co. and Michael will be, you know, part of this work. Um, so yeah, so just like stay tuned for that. Um, and then I just wanted to just, you know, final plug, just, you know, this work takes a lot of people power. And so I just invite you all to get involved with this work. Um, all emergency food providers are working on limited limited budgets, um, and so volunteerism is hugely appreciated. Um, so I just wrote up some ways that you guys can get involved, um, but really I invite you all to, if you're interested in getting involved, see me after, um, and we can figure out a way to make use of your specific skill set, or if you just want to work in you know, our pantry, helping to stock shelves, helping to receive deliveries, helping to our customer shop, helping to prepare meals. Um, we really, you know, welcome you all. Um, so, so thanks. There's Q&A, but this is really an opportunity to have a conversation. And so comments, questions, you name it. I have some of my own. Uh, Charles, I mean, you brought me here, so I have to think I should defer to you for our, our first question. And I'll, re I'll repeat the questions. So this morning I had a conversation with somebody here in the audience, um, if she wants to make herself known, about who... <laughs> This morning I had a conversation with someone that's here today um, in this audience if she wants to make herself known about food pantries and we were talking about food pantries at colleges and how CUNY and SUNY schools now have to, are going to be required to have food pantries or suggested that they have food pantries, right? And uh, the conversation was about how uh, stigma, stigmatizing it is um, for a student and I would think that that would carry over to any, anybody uh, to have to go into a food pantry um, to get food as opposed to some way of thinking innovative and creatively to get people that need, you know, that need emergency food, food. I guess I put this on. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so so the stigma around food, right? About about visiting a food pantry. Um, so what I will say, and I'm going to speak about our mobile market work. Um, when we um, partner with an organization to bring our mobile market, um, we will we pull up our truck A, which is a beautiful. It's it's beautiful, right? We. I mean, oftentimes people, it's it, it's almost like has the feel of a farmer's market, I will say. And I mean, we get people who come up to us and they, they want to make a purchase. Um, and so I think we really take great pride in our customer service and how we treat people who come, uh, making sure that we treat everybody with respect. Um, we never, you know, we... we don't turn people away necessarily. Like if you're coming to our 86th Street location, um, you won't get, you, nobody gets turned away. Everybody is served. Um, and we, we just try to really promote the community aspect. And like I said, we're now no longer calling it a pantry because it's, a, it's actually a market and we recreate a shopping experience that you would have like at your neighborhood grocery store. Developing the question as I'm going to talk because I have a lot of questions. Um, thank you both. Yeah. I can play this role. All right, happy. <laughs> I got questions for you too. All right. Um, so, emergency food kind of makes uh, I feel like uh, the job of people who are well, people who are involved in creating better food systems in low income or under resourced communities harder because when people feel like I can get this for free, uh, why would I bother buying this from Green Market, Fresh Food Box, or a food co-op? Um, why, you know, why would I do this? And a lot of the research that I look at focuses on the creation of food deserts. And part of it is that a response to hunger by policymakers was to encourage um, uh, supermarkets to give their spoiled foods to food pantries and sort of make that easier for them to do. And so I, that's part of how that industry got born, by responding to hun hunger in that way. Um, so what I see from a lot of organizations that work on emergency food is sort of like a shift in their work to uh, really address the inequities in these communities that cause people to come to food pantries. But what I also see is a sort of pairing of, um, of the same kind of like work that we're doing around food systems in emergency food organizations, customers, um, saying markets, you know, using terms that I feel more come out in line with food systems. So green market, you serve customers. Food co-ops, you have customers. They're customers because they purchase food and they have the power to make decisions and they have ownership and different things like that. Whereas with pantries, I don't necessarily feel that they do because, you know, they're beholden to whatever is there. Um, sort of like a long-winded way to say, I find it problematic in a way. And it's, it's very difficult to hear that because I, I know people who work in communities that you guys serve who do urban, who are urban gardeners, who have markets, who have a really difficult time serving their communities because they're like, I could just get it for free over there. And so maybe the question is, what is your organization doing to address that and look at it from a way that you're not necessarily taking away from these sustainable, because we've been talking a lot about sustainability, these sustainable food system models um, that you're not sort of taking up too much space, too much funding, too much of anything like that, and sort of maybe, you know, either looking at it from a way of like, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, but I'm trying to develop the question, uh, but look at it from a way of like reducing your presence because the, be the more that people are able to purchase their food and own food systems, the less that you guys are needed. So I'm wondering what you guys are doing to us that end. Okay, so huh, I, I mean, I, I, I'll like attempt. I don't know if I'm gonna fully, but I hear what you're saying. So, um, I mean, I guess what I want to say is I don't, I don't see them as in competition with one another. 
Um, I think that, look, there is a population of people, the people that, you know, are food insecure, that are facing so many challenges that are, you know, every statistic, right, like health, like mental health, like there, there's just so many challenges, right? And, and I think that they don't, I, I don't see, I don't see emergency food competing because I think it's like a survival mechanism for folks. Like it, if it's a matter of like paying my doctor's bill or eating healthy food, like I'm going to pay my doctor's bill. And so if like they can get free healthy food, we're making a positive contribution. Um, I mean, yes, like urban agriculture and like owning your own food system is important. And I think we do contribute. And I think like this work we're doing around collective purchasing, you know, might get us to that place, right? So, you know, I think one of our goals is like, how can we support a sustainable food system? One that, you know, values its workers, one, one that values the environment. Um, and I think by pooling together some of these larger, you know, institutions that actually, you know, 40% of our food budget, um, it, it, we're, we're buying food. So we have, we, ought, we have a big, and then if you combine that with all the other emergency food providers and social service organizations, we can actually make like a real big impact on regional agriculture as an example and then, and job creation around that. Um, so I think if we can, you know, I think, and I think we have a responsibility as emergency food providers to look at the bigger picture of our food system and ways that we can be a positive actor in the space. Um, and then when you think about like the role of like, so if I am food insecure and I am, do have SNAP benefits, that can have a significant impact on um, like, retail that supports whether it be like urban agriculture like so like I'm just thinking about farmers markets right and I know that a lot of the like green markets like if I think about like a Po Park in the Bronx right I mean that's almost completely supported by the amount of SNAP benefits and the WIC farmers market nutrition checks and health bucks right like there's actually not much cash being exchanged there so I just think it's like if you are trying to start like a food co-op or like a, I don't know, I don't know what you, maybe, maybe I'm misinterpreting your question, but I think there's ways that we can work together and still serve our community and still solve some of these bigger picture food system issues that are ultimately gonna result in less food insecurity and a more sustainable environment, et cetera. It's a, it's, that's a very dope, quite good question because <clears throat> Think about like the normalization of the emergency food experience by changing language and, and giving people the opportunity to not feel that it is a stigma attached to it. And then when you're doing all that, you're normalizing that that reality can continue to grow out and expand and you provide wraparound services. Do you give policymakers and those who are not in the realm to problem solve a justification to keep expanding that model because it's normalized? You're giving people this sense of like, this is a dope, good experience, and we're gonna make it good, which you should do as a service provider. And how do you run parallel and say, we don't need to keep expanding this reality? That's tough. That's real tough because there's gonna be a thousand people, hundreds of people saying, yo, we need to expand the mobile markets because it's a good experience uptown. And there needs to be an outcry and say, but why are we expanding that? Why has it become a normalized experience? That's just like going to the corner store or going to the farmer's market. So I think there is a level of responsibility to this discussion as there is a need, and there's gonna be a need because New York City is crazy expensive, that funding that response shouldn't negate looking at the root causes and everything else that's going on. So it's, it's, it's a dilemma, and it's, a, it's an interesting frame. I've, I've heard people say it, but hearing the presentation and, and thinking about your question and, and your statement, I was like, wow, that is so true because it becomes this normalized discussion that was never intended to be normal, but, ne but it has become normalized. And I volunteer a lot in Yorkville Common Pantry, and I, and I love the supermarket experience, and I love everything they do, but I do think about how generational families are coming through, and that's, that shouldn't be normal. 
You know, we got to figure that out and talk about and work towards it, addressing that. I get to chime in. So in 1997, we were calling young adults who were going through the criminal justice system, utilizing services, consumers of those services to destigmatize, calling them clients. So it's just an extension of this nonprofit. Uh, industrial complex. Industrial complex. Um, and capitalism. No, um, always. Always. And I will say that, you know, there has been an 80% increase in pantry use over the la in the last five years in New York. And a lot of that is because of the SNAP cuts that happened in 2013. SNAP was part of the stimulus. It reverted back. Um, and retail prices of food went up. So, I, Allison, I loved your answer where if food pantries can actually pool their money and use their discretionary funding to support regional agriculture and use their buying power, I think that's an Im important piece. That said, we used to have a food box program at Queensboro, the Queensboro houses, Queensbridge houses, sorry. And City Harvest set up a mobile market and we could no longer sustain our food box program. And this is why relationships are important because they're our friends, and they are our, our, our partners. Until we have a, I mean, we're, I, seriously, we've been talking about, we're chipping away here at a food system where there is always going to be, not all, well, hopefully not always, but there is a need for emergency food. So we sat down with them and we pulled up a map. We started being very proactive together about where our programs could support one another and where there couldn't be that direct overlap and essential competition so that we could build distribution centers and durable lasting distribution routes that at the same time they could do with the emergency food for where folks really needed it. Yeah. Um, quick question. We have a question right I think, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, my question is around changing the narrative and building the capacity with partners to change that narrative. And in my experience with doing sort of like system change type work is encountering or dealing with the hard realities of sometimes how the system is designed and people who are partners who you think are on your side benefit from the status quo and are resistant. And I was wondering if you could speak more about strategies and working within institutions and with partners um, to move beyond that. So this is like the work that I think I was trying, born to do in so many ways. Like I really think that the discussions that happen in every community board meeting, at every meeting that I've ever been to, really does benefit you know the providers, the service providers in terms of seeking resources and responding to to to, the, to, to clear needs. And the hard part about capacity building and sharing information with those types of big not-for-profits or small not-for-profits or not-for-profits that have been germane to neighbors that have been doing good services for a long time is, you know, you, you're not trying to say go out of business by thinking about systems change. It's not supposed to be an intimidating discussion. It's just saying, you know, that the work that's needed to really eradicate this problem can never be addressed by your program. If your program is at capacity, if you're constantly referring out to other neighborhoods and jurisdictions for services, you know that this problem can't be solved by yourself. There will always be a need for services in society. But the amount of services to address the problem will never be fulfilled. So in discussing the root causes and discussing what needs to be done, I've really leaned on the fact that it's an and discussion. You can go into a city council hearing and literally say, the work that we need in X community can be addressed by this type of program, and simultaneously we can have an approach that in 10 years this program is no longer needed, there'll be another program needed. It takes time. I just tried this out with City Harvest today and failed. And, and I mean that respectfully because they were like, we, we can't do that yet. We can't have that discussion yet. We have to build the evidence, and then the board would feel comfortable and others would feel comfortable so we can shift this narrative. So my approach is going with and first. It, it can't be an either or discussion, it's an and discussion, especially in neighborhoods that have been disinfected, neighborhoods who are black and brown, non-citizen and immigrant, 
they want to get those responses and they deserve it. It's just saying to that CBO, you do have a responsibility of going given the complete picture. And we as government have to do that. So my thing with, with where I work is that we've been negligent in discussing these problems. We have said our service response is the issue, is, is the way in which we respond, as opposed to giving the fuller picture. We can't give the fuller picture at times because what ends up happening is we're calling out other agencies and we're stopped. So our research, which is why I've, I talked about the re our research agenda can do that in a way that isn't confrontational. And then we share that research with leaders who can have better conversations <coughs> with elected officials that can be more well versed in what the responses could be. So I'm holding hope that the capacity building really comes out of a different frame around the research that we're doing as an institution <coughs> that can then translate it to better and conversations in neighborhoods. Now it's my turn? Okay, great. Um, so just a question to reconcile the map that you showed. The majority of food-related illness, or because of um, food insecurity, like diabetes and obesity, whatever, <coughs> looks to be higher in rural areas across um, the country. Um, and in the states that had the largest <coughs> cities um, were rated lower on the scale of um, incidences of um, those illnesses. So what is causing, um, if not food deserts, aside from poverty, what is causing food insecurity across the country in rural areas? <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, What's amazing is there's a grant out right now for the Healthy Food and Financing in Initiative. And if you look at the map, the national map of counties that are eligible, New York is not considered, um, it, it actually, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. There, we're not in the color code that identifies us as having the same lack of distance to existing food and lack of available food. Um, we are eligible, because if you look at actually neighborhoods that are eligible for the FRESH program, <coughs> we, you, those neighborhoods can then apply. So available food distance. So if you looked at pocket, like Allison said, if you look at pockets within New York City, there are high, incredibly high disproportionate <coughs> rates of lack of access, but because of the proximity of and how small I mean, New York is, is tiny in terms of geography, right, land base. Um, so within a mile, you could have multiple points, you could have multiple supermarkets, multiple bodegas or grocery stores, or what would be identified as have, have, have access because that distance doesn't, doesn't exist. But in rural, I mean, rural community, I mean, we know that there is more poverty in rural communities than in, in cities, yet the conversation has been defined differently for Racial racial factors. Um, I I talked about uh, percentage of populations that are utilizing SNAP between urban and rural communities a couple, a couple weeks ago, um, and it is that lack of available food, that lack of access, and extreme rates of, of poverty in rural communities. I mean, we have farmers who qualify for food stamps who cannot afford to eat the, the products that they're bringing into New York City to sell. And so are the solutions the same for urban <coughs> food insecurity and rural food insecurity? Or would we tackle that differently? I mean, there are bodegas you, in urban you would, I would, I would tackle it very, very differently, and yet the starting point is also looking at wealth creation, distribution of wealth, and, and poverty. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> my name's Deanna. Um, I'm a community organizer. And we talk a lot about um, just like the cons or just the overlaps between like environmental challenges, inclusive of like health equity, inequity, et cetera. Um, and so these are interesting conversations. Um, the week this week is like overproduction, right? It's like the theme. Am I correct? I think that, I think the class is focused on that our industrial food that our U.S. food policy has been about creating an abundance of cheap food. And that that has led to environmental issues, wealth creation within the food sector, 
and just and <coughs> consolidation of wealth within the food sector, and who is valued, and then access and the impact of that overproduction on human health. Great. Um, yeah, I, I just I think for me, like just being able to say out loud that we have like one service that is providing food to the hungry, and then when we had talked briefly about um, obesity also being a challenge, just how intensely both of those things are present um, is really interesting to me. Like in our food system, we can have such polar things going on at the same time. Um, and also like the connections on like why those, right, like the abundance of cheap food and the abundance of not healthy options and the importance of getting those into the hands of consumers, um, customers, whatever this language based around money is. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to like point that out that it's like, at least for me, like I look at it and I'm just like, wow, we have so many hungry people and also we have so many, like we have so much food all the time everywhere. Like I think about Venezuela where like my, some of my family members can't get a bag of rice. We will never experience that, right? Like we cannot, it, and, and not in the sense that like we can't actually buy it, but that like we go into a grocery store, whether or not you can purchase things <coughs> in that grocery store, and our shelves are always full. Um, and like that's just a, an interesting position to be in with like what our options are, how it's populated, the things that we end up um, having as options, you know, like we have Welch's fruit snacks on deck everywhere, Ritz crackers on deck, like Cheerios on deck, right? And like, it's wild, it's wild to me that like you can have that, the abundance of so much that isn't actually nourishing us in the ways that we need to and isn't actually accessible to everyone in the ways that it needs to be. Um, and so distribution is like the thing that we come to, whether you're in a pantry or as a shop healthy food program, right? Like either in any of those facets, like the distribution of wealth, the distribution of access, the distribution of knowledge, the like, I can't like talk with my hands when I'm holding the mic. Um, but the, the pyramid, right, of like capitalism, of like wealth <coughs> concentration, of all of those things that like force us into these repeated patterns that depending on what side you're on benefit different arrangements. So yes, there's like an abundance of cheap food and that's good because you can eat, but like you're not ever gonna eat something that's like good for you in the long term that like doesn't give you cancer or whatever. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yep. Um, I have a question, I have a question right here. I have a question, but a comment. Um, I've worked all my life in nonprofit, and I've made referrals to pantries, but I never told a client to go to a soup kitchen. Um, I'm the volunteer manager at Holy Apostle Soup Kitchen, which is the largest soup kitchen in New York State and the second largest soup kitchen in the country. And I joined the agency last August. So I understood homelessness, but I really didn't understand food insecurity. Um, until I came to the soup kitchen and I saw we have parents that come in with children. The majority are single men who are street homeless, but um, it, I was shocked to see parents um, at the soup kitchen, people who were recently laid off, people who are working but were making minimum wage and come to the soup kitchen for the meal and the, the social service that we have. Um, we have a, work, a volunteer workforce, um, an annual volunteer workforce of over 15,000 volunteers. And we, the soup kitchen is open Monday through Friday. We serve the hot meal from 10.30 to 12.30. And from 10.30 to 12.30, the operations is run by um, 50 to 60 volunteers every day. So it is a large volunteer workforce. And I just wanted to extend an invitation to anyone that wanted to come and see the soup kitchen behind the scenes, um, how we operate. We have a vibrant bag, um, bag lunch program. And fr this Friday, we're starting a backpack pantry program where um, 400 families to pick up a backpack. Um, it, will, it includes food to feed a family of four over the weekend. Um, and it's done that we have uh, corporate groups and they've been very responsive to uh, supporting um, that, that project. But I thought it would be interesting if um, any of you wanted to come to the soup kitchen and you know really see um, how we feed 
on, um, on a daily basis, we serve um, an average of a thousand meals every day. And I don't see a soup kitchen ever going out of it, you know, ever going out of business that New Yorkers will not need a soup kitchen. So if you know if you're interested in coming to the soup kitchen and checking us out in terms of operations and volunteers, just you know, let me know or you know let the program know. Hey, if you want to email me information that we can send around, <coughs> we're happy to do that. Um, so my question, I guess, is about the relation between food justice and gentrification, which was mentioned by Javier and also um, in part of our readings. Um, so I was wondering if first Javier could elaborate a little more on what a food mirage is, because I've never heard that term before. Um, and then also in the reading, we saw um, some different patterns of like this one neighborhood was gentrifying and the uh, grocery store closed. And then there's also um, thinking of like, if a farmer's market opens up in a neighborhood, can that rate, I mean, that can be seen as a way to like raise the rents there because now realtors can say, oh, it's within walking distance of a farmer's market, so they might be able to charge more. Um, and so I'm just curious how food justice feeds into housing justice because it does seem like there's a lot of factors interacting there um, and what your analyses are of that. Um, so the reason I gave like some inside like reality into my world is that my, our colleagues at the health department at the Division of Epidemiology are doing a lot of work on housing and gentrification and, and how people are displaced. So knowing that they're working in that area, we were like, let's, let's layer it with the food retail work that we're doing and trying to come up with a correlation of price points and affordability because there hasn't been a march in some time for the agency is my understanding around food insecurity. So we wanted to, to try to merge those worlds together. So what I was showing was like an opportunistic opportunistic time for us to, to bring the research communities that we were talking about and they are leading to come together so that we can produce um, you know, a neighborhood snapshot of what's happening in neighborhoods and how people are being housing displaced, how, uh, you know, what affordability means within tiers in communities in specific neighborhoods. When I say communities, there are many communities in a neighborhood. So we hope to, to start producing uh, works that, that, that speak to that. And a food mirage is really, you know, when, when a community is gentrifying and somebody wants to bring in, you know, um, it's not a Trader Joe's or an Aldi's, but like a boutique, a boutique store, if you will, like a different type of corner store, a different type of, of transformational food retail environment where things are, you know, um, seem to be ubiquitous in terms of availability, but in terms of price points, people who can't afford it, um, that's, that's what I'm referring to in a food mirage. You say, oh, there's mad places to go to now. You can go to this cafe, you can go to this, um, these pop-up stores or even this new corner store, and you go in there and you see affordability for the longtime resident that may be across the street at Wagner Houses, they can't, that, that's not in their price point, but the people who are moving in, it says there's many places to, to shop in this neighborhood because of the realtors and because of consumerism and capitalism and the market forces. So we were in this food desert discussion for many of the same neighborhoods for a long time. And I hate terminology because it gets thrown around and co-opted or who you don't even know who's designing it. But a food mirage thing within the context of gentrification is something that I think uh, is really, um, accurate in, in so many ways because uh, the, the transformational food retail environment is, is being experienced but not for everybody. So you asked me a pretty tough question here. Um, and I'm going to give you an answer and then at the end I'm going to say there's no question that realtors use farmers markets as a way to entice <coughs> new residents coming into a community. Um, from a gentrification standpoint, I think one of the things that when we establish a new market, we are looking very much to partner with the existing community and have it be a resource for folks who have been long-term residents and to the extent to own it, whether it's from, through hiring, whether it's through who we partner with and what community groups can be on the ground uh, working you know, and, um, and what groups are community groups are able to come to the market and be, have a physical presence. So it's really about the people who are already there. Um, we try to match what foods are brought in 
that we look at, like what farmers we place in that market so that they are culturally appropriate, um, which I think is part of the, the food mirage. All of a sudden, a, a bodega becomes all organic and, and long-term products that were present there that, it, that were relevant and what we're serving the existing community all of a sudden are gone. Um, we are very conscientious to that we are there to be a partner and to be owned by the communities in which we're going. I'm not going to sit here and blow smoke up your ass and say that we cannot also be a driving force and be seen as a resource. Um, going back to Javier's comment before, I left, I was a social worker and I left social work a long time ago because I saw that certain communities got services and other communities got investment and resources. And so I was, can, I want, no longer wanted to be a part of that yep. program and that was through the criminal injustice and the child welfare system. And so I, what I want to do is to create resources. Mm -hmm. I do recognize that this resource creation can be a catalyst and we work in other ways to ensure, and if you look at where we are, where the markets are, are located, I wouldn't say that there has been overall that we've seen that as a real cause causal relationship, but we're certainly in neighborhoods that have transformed over the last 15 to 20 years. And, envir and environmental justice folks face the same dilemma. Environmental EJ folks just change everything that I've known. I worked in EJ for years and I worked in the Bronx River restoration and, and so in the Kiwanis. When, that's, when that happens, you know, the realtors are paying attention to it and then it just pops off. So it's, it's tough. Like, brown and, brown and black people fight to transform their neighbors and their own, and then they come. And it's just a hard reality because you want to live in a good neighborhood. You want to see your riverfront be nice, and the next thing you know is, oh, thank you for cleaning that up. We're going to build this up here. So it's, 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 it's many different well-intentioned programs and services and transformation work is aligned with capitalism and market forces. And, and I don't know until we change the way our laws and our, our society functions, like how to, how to stop that. It's Char hard. Sorry. Carl's just, Charles just kicked me a, a very nice assist in saying that Union Square Farmer's Market is the third largest redeem redeemer of SNAP farmer's markets in the country, mm -hmm. right? It's also located in a community that transformed greatly yeah. since 1976. Right, and where commercial rents are now seventy-five thousand dollars a month for the Pret a Manger that's across the street. So, it's still ensuring that there is accessibility and affordability in those locations, and it can serve as a resource for and be welcoming. Um, if we have time for one more, we don't have what time for one more. But before you go, I'm sorry. I want to recognize Pam Nepper, who is in the crowd. Sorry, Pam. I work with Pam, and she has helped me put together all of my PowerPoints, and has been my coach and mentor. So Pam, sorry. Um, I want to thank Javier and Allison for being here tonight. I mean, it really was, was fantastic. Stick around if you want to. Um, you certainly don't have to. Next week is our last uh, time together, and Barbara Turk and Karen Washington will be joining us. So thanks very much. I want to know